Hey, what's going on, smart particles? So, when I was a kid, I was pretty curious about different things. I used to try to experiment with different objects, and I tried to find out what these things did. One of those things was sticking my hand in electrical sockets. And what I really wanted to find out was how our appliances got power. So, as a kid, I used to stick my finger inside electrical sockets. And we all know what happens with ha when you stick your finger inside one. You get electrocuted. But what really happens inside these electrical sockets and what give power to our appliances? That's what we're going to be talking about today. So, why are metals attracted to magnets? Well, the main reason is because their atoms have charges. But why do they have charges? Well, let's break it down this way. Atoms are made of three fundamental particles. The electron, the proton, and the neutron. Neutrons are neutrally charged, protons are positively charged, and electrons are negatively charged. Most of the time, the electrons are the ones moving around. They're always very agitated, and they like to bounce around in different places. So, with that in mind, a magnet is a piece of metal or piece of material that is usually polarized, meaning that all the electrons, the negatively charged parts, are all in one side while the protons or the positively charged particles are on the other side. The reason why these magnets attract other metals is because the electrons in the metal are attracted to the sides of the magnet. Thus, they want to come close together in order to interact with each other. Because as we know, the universe wants to go into equilibrium and everything wants to interact with each other. The universe does this interaction almost every millisecond of the day. The force between all of these interactions are so small that we cannot feel it. Unless, of course, it's like a big supernova, then we'll probably feel it in a few billion years, depending on where it is. But, except for those special cases, the interaction between other electrons and other particles are very small that we cannot feel it. So, for today, in order to help explain what's happening between all of these things, let's put up some assumptions to make things easier to understand. Let's take a look at one single particle, the electron. These electrons are so 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 small that we can treat them like points in an infinite plane. Plane meaning an x and y axis or in a more complex way the x, y and z. But for now let's just look at the x and y axis. This infinite plane in relative to the electron is the world around us. The reason why we can treat it like a point in an infinite plane it's because these electrons are so small compared to the whole world around us. Imagine trying to look at yourself from space. You probably won't see yourself. That's exactly what we're trying to look at an electron is. This concept of an electron in an infinite plane is what Charles Augustin de Coulomb thought of when he was conducting his experiment with a pith ball and a needle. So what was his experiment? What he did was he suspended a needle on a very fine fiber of silver and at the end of it was an electrically charged ball. And one of the sides of the experiment was another equally charged ball. And as it would get closer and closer, the needle ball would move. This is how he created his famous Coulomb's Law. Coulomb's law states that the electrical force between two objects is equal to a constant times the two objects' charges divided by the distance between them. In this case, what we want to find out is the force between an electron and another electron or an electron and a proton. From here on out, we'd want to call these things point charges. The reason why we call them point charges is because they act like a point in a plane, just like what I said a while ago, and they have a induced charge already on them. An electron and a proton actually have the same magnitude of charge. The only difference is an electron is negatively charged and a proton is positively charged. The magnitude of their charges is equal to this number right here. Remember what I said about magnets a while ago? Well, this is the perfect time to get up your magnets again. Coulomb's law is a perfect explanation as to why the magnets and the metal will interact with each other. As you get closer and closer, the distance between them gets smaller and smaller, but the charges remain the same because the charge of an object always stays the same unless you induce more charge or remove charge. So, the forces between them will start getting stronger and stronger as you get closer and closer. Thus, why magnets and metal, when you put them close enough, they stick to each other. You can also try your own homemade experiment just like what Charles Coulomb did. It's called a jar electroscope. An electroscope is basically what Charles Coulomb did back then, and it measures the charge of a certain object in comparison 
to another object. So what we can use this electroscope for is to test the charge of a certain object. So let's take a balloon and what you want to do is take that balloon and rub it against your hair. After rubbing it against your hair, put it close to the spiral of in the top of the lid. You'll notice the aluminum tassels, those teardrop things we made a while ago, start to move apart. What's happening in this electroscope? Basically, let's put it this way. The aluminum foil is in a neutral state, meaning that there's an even distribution between the protons and the electrons, or the positives and the negative charges within the system, the aluminum foil. But when we place the balloon near the top of the jar, the net charge from the balloon, negative, transfers to the foil. This negative charge pushes the negative, other negative charges of the foil further down the tassels or the teardrop aluminum foils we made. And because we know that like and like repel each other, tassels push each other away. So why does this happen? Let's use Coulomb's law to figure this out. So these negative charges are caused by electrons and these electrons have their own electric field or the area around them through which you can feel their force. These electric fields are always pointing inwards. But what makes them repel? Why is it that when we have an electron and an electron and the electric fields are always pointing inwards towards them, why is it going away? So the reason for this is because the electron will always attract free protons or free positive charges around itself. Protons or positively charged particles have an electric field that points outwards. That's why we have opposites attract because the protons are pointing outwards while the electrons are pointing inwards. Therefore, the protons are the one being attracted towards the electron. And this is why we have the tassels push each other away because these electrons attract other protons to latch onto it and these protons have an outward electric field and these outward electric fields push other electric fields away thus making the tassels go outward let's try and quantify what's happening here so it's easier to understand so how do we quantify the force between an electron and a proton that's Coulomb's law f is equal to k constant times q1 times q2 which is the charge of the objects that we're looking at over r which is the distance between the two objects squared so with this we want to look at the interaction between an electron and a proton constant here is coulomb's constant equal to 9 times 10 raised to 9 newton meter squared per coulomb squared or in the, in the equation form k is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught or epsilon zero Epsilon naught here, or epsilon zero, is to account for the permittivity of free space. Big word. What does this mean? Basically, we're trying to say that it's in a vacuum, and we're accounting for the free space around an object. So, with that out of the way, let's get down to calculating the interaction between an electron and a proton within your electroscope. First, let's assume that we can take each electron on its own as a point charge and contest it with the proton in the free space within the jar. Also, we want to see what happens with one proton and one electron. We can just multiply the force between the interaction between one and one by a factor of how many protons and electrons we want to see. We only want one proton, one neutron, one electron, and we want to see it within the jar itself only. All right, what's the distance between them? Well, let's make up a value that seems relatively reasonable for a proton and electron to interact with. Let's use 20 picometers. 20 picometers is pretty small. We probably can't see it. So if you want to quantify how small a picometer is, it's basically a trillionth of a meter. And that's very, very small. So that's how we want to quantify the distance between the electron and the proton within our problem here. So like I said a while ago, the charge of an electron and a proton will be equal to this number right here, which is 1.6 times 10 raised to the negative 19th coulombs. Coulombs is our unit of measurement for a charge, a single charge. Now, the difference between the proton and electron is the protons is positive 1.6 and the electron is negative 1.6 times 10 raised to the negative 19th. So we have our values already here. 
Let's get to calculating the force between these two. When we plug it into the function or the equation, we get k times negative 1.6 times 10 raised to the negative 19th times positive 1.6 times 10 raised to the negative 19th over 20 picometers. But we have to change these picometers into meters because we want the value or the units to be coherent. So in order to change 20 picometers into meters, we divide it by a trillion or 10 raised to 12. This gives us 12 times 10 raised to the negative 12. After plugging it into the function, we get 1.15 times 10 raised to the negative 17 newtons, which is very, very small for these electrons. Makes sense because electrons and protons are very, very tiny. See, wasn't that easy? We'll get more in depth with these charges and electricity and further videos that I'll be making down the line. Sorry for the delay in content. I've been very busy with school and all these tests. Uh, it's been pretty stressful. So yeah, hopefully I'll be getting back and schedule these monthly videos and hopefully they help you understand physics concepts, which I find really fun. And I hope I get to embed more of my love for physics to you guys. So thank you guys for watching. Leave a like and a subscribe. I'll catch you guys next time. See you smart particles. The next video.